Okay, it's a pleasure to have today with us Davide Faranda. Davide is a CNRS researcher in complex systems at the Laboratory of Climate and Environment Sciences in the University of Paris Saclay. And he's also coordinator of a, of a group and there on extremes, statistics, impacts, and regional, regionalization. He's also an external fellow of the London Mathematical Laboratory and also the uh, Laboratory of Dynamic Meteorology at L'Ecole Normale in Paris. Um, Davide <clears throat> graduated in Bologna, Italy in 2008 on, a, on, a, on atmospheric physics and meteorology and also did their Master of Science. And then he moved to Hamburg University for a PhD on Earth Sciences and Applied Mathematics under the supervision of Valerio Lucarini. And he got the PhD in 2013. And then after this, he had several positions in the area of Paris until in 2015, he got the, the CNRS position he has, he has now. He has um, several hours, as for example, the European Geoscience Union Nonlinear Processes Division Outstanding Early Career Scientist Award. And also he was the winner of the European Geosciences Union Best Blog Post in 2019. He's also a member of the editorial board of COWS. Um, okay, his research has, uh, has been in the, uh, in the area of um, addressing climate uh, phenomena from the point of view of complex systems and nonlinear dyna dynamics. And okay, he has uh, worked in extreme value theory and attribution of, uh, of uh, climatic events, critical phenomena in, in complex systems, detecting transition thresholds, and other aspects of uh, turbulent uh, and uh, geophysical flows. And uh, he was, the topic of today is uh, about machine learning and, and atmospheric uh, physics. So the title is When Machine Learning Deciphers the Language of Atmospheric Air Masses. So, Davide, it's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, very, very nice uh, introduction, and uh, the pleasure is mine to give this remote seminar uh, uh, from Paris to Palma, and uh, hopefully uh, sometimes we will meet in person if the conditions improve. And uh, as Emilio said, today I'm going to give you an new technique uh, of machine learning that we have imported from linguistic. And that's why you see in the title of this talk, uh, there is uh, the word language. Uh, and uh, this work has been done mostly by my brilliant master student, Luca, uh, who's going to start soon a PhD uh, with me, and uh, Berenger uh, Dubrul. Uh, and the other collaborator of this work is Flavio Pons, who's postdoc in our uh, institution, in Berenger Poduan, uh, who's an expert on numerical techniques for uh, uh, turbulent uh, flows. Uh, so let's get it started. And uh, why uh, we uh, need uh, an artificial intelligence uh, in meteorology. So um, there are many, many applications now on machine learning in climate science and also meteorology. I'm sure you are aware that uh, it's like a, a pandemic somehow. So there is an explosion of uh, studies on these uh, topics. Uh, but uh, what, when we uh, want to mix uh, machine learning use in linguistic and meteorology, what we aim at is interpretability. So it's to have some machine learning that uh, provides us with uh, uh, an easy and uh, meaningful interpretation of the uh, climate. So um, uh, to get this uh, interpretability, we start uh, with the idea that we have uh, when looking at the weather forecast every day, uh, so that uh, you can, so this map that I'm showing you is a sea level pressure map. So it shows you the pressure uh, at different location in the US. This one is for the US. And the way we will uh, um, we will see this map, or we will hear a meteorologist interpreting this map at the television, uh, looking at the weather channel, for example, will be like uh, there is a low pressure system 
uh, on the east coast of the United States. So it's gonna rain in New York and uh, probably then we'll also say uh, the high pressure system over the Rocky Mountains warns you to uh, go to visit the Grand Canyon uh, in the early hours in the morning, right? So this is the, the lecture that uh, the meteorologists will give, the teaser, like we'll isolate cyclones and anticyclones. And then we know that cyclones are associated with bad weather conditions and anticyclones are associated with good or uh, maybe too hot weather condition, foggy in winter. So these meteorologists can do it very well for each uh, daily uh, map. But when we are interested in climate, we are interested in much longer time scales, right? We want to see, uh, we would like to have this kind of analysis for each of the maps that we have in our observational database or in the models that we produce. Like if we pick up the map of uh, the 2nd of January, 1974, we would like to know, for example, for the North Atlantic, if there was the Azor anticyclone, if there was uh, uh, a perturbation over uh, the Balearic Islands, or if there was a Scandinavian blocking and these kind of things. So uh, that's why we introduced this technique uh, to get this kind of information and to make out of this information some uh, climate uh, uh, studies. So wha what we don't have, so we are able to uh, decompose uh, the weather maps already into um, uh, other maps actually uh, that are obtained. And here I'm, I know that uh, some of these uh, acronyms will speak to you uh, via, for example, the EOF, the empirical orthogonal function, or the POD, proper orthogonal decomposition, or even if you want simpler, the Fourier transform, uh, the first components of the wavelet transform, whatever you like. So. Traditionally, what we do, and now I will focus more on uh, our uh, side of the uh, world, so on the North Atlantic, what we end up when we look at the North Atlantic is that we can associate each map uh, of uh, pressure for every day to one of these four prototype maps, okay? And you see these are uh, kind of intuitive in the sense that we have uh, a positive North Atlantic oscillation that is a map with a cyclone, between Iceland and the UK, and then an anticyclone over the Mediterranean. So this is good weather over the Mediterranean, bad weather over UK. Then we have the NAO negative, which is the other way around with the anticyclone over Greenland and the cyclone over Spain and uh, France. So bad weather for us. And then we have other two maps that are the Scandinavian blocking, where the, this is a good weather over uh, the north of Europe and bad weather in uh, uh, the east of Europe uh, and uh, over uh, Africa. And then we have the Atlantic Ridge that this is, brings usually cold spell over uh, Eastern Europe and good weather over uh, Portugal and uh, uh, South of Spain. So uh, the problem of using this decomposition, which is very famous in climate science, is that as you can see in each of these maps, there are uh, different uh, uh, cyclones and anticyclones. So each map include more than one object, okay? So for example, if we take uh, the Atlantic Ridge, you see that there is a, a high pressure maximum uh, here uh, over the, uh, the Atlantic, but then there is a, a low pressure over uh, the east of Europe, and then there is another one over the east coast, and another one weaker over the um, uh, well, over the mid-Atlantic Ocean. So uh, if I uh, have just the information that on a given day, the uh, atmospheric maps of the North Atlantic project in one of these maps, I don't really know what is happening, okay, at a specific location. So they lack of interpretability. So uh, to uh, avoid this problem, we use this uh, technique that is the latent Dirichlet allocation that work uh, exactly as a human meteorologist is instead of decomposing the uh, maps into other maps that contains uh, that contain more than one feature, it will uh, give us the information of what is in the map starting with each object. So with the most striking feature. So for example, it will tell us in this map, 
there is this cyclone, then there is this other anticyclone, and so on and so forth. So let's see how it works. Uh, so here I'm making the parallel between uh, linguistic on the left and uh, the uh, weather maps that we analyze on the right, okay? So in linguistic, we have a corpus that is an ensemble of documents, and each document is a list of words, okay? And as you can see here, I'm representing three documents. And uh, this bag of words uh, tell you that there are some words that is uniquely identified as, for example, fruits, strawberry. Here is just a fruit. But then, for example, there is another word that can be orange, that can be identified both as a color or as a fruit, okay? So we can build up categories that are called topics, uh, by uh, uh, looking for uh, the recurrence of the, of the words in the documents. Similarly, uh, what we will do is that we will uh, look for, uh, uh, instead of topics, motifs uh, that can also be superimposed. For example, here we show that uh, the Azor anticyclone can be superimposed, for example, to the Mediterranean anticyclone. Uh, whereas the Icelandic, Icelandic law is isolated, and we will end up really with the detection of this uh, object. So the idea will, uh, will be to exchange the topics color fruit season with motifs that are the kind of objects that the meteorologists uh, give us the weather forecast, like the Mediterranean anticyclone, the Azor anticyclone, the Icelandic law. How do we do it in practice? So we have to define uh, documents as bags of words and words uh, uh, WI uh, belongs to a finite vocabulary V uh, so with N N words, okay? So uh, documents are represented by vector D of L where D of L is the number of occurrence of the words WI in each document L. It, this is very simple, okay? So um, to uh, go again to the previous example, but uh, more in details now, what we see is that uh, if we take the topics, colors, fruits, and season, uh, we can get for each of the world the weight in the topic. And for example, as you see, orange will appear twice, uh, and it will have a weight 0, 2 when it's colors, and 0, 3. Uh, here when it's uh, uh, fruits, okay? Uh, winter is a double weight with respect to, to, to the other uh, because we, uh, we count that uh, it appears, for example, here four times, okay? Uh, instead of the others appears just uh, one time. Uh, and so uh, we can compute this weight, the, the, the weight. So uh, this, the other information that we get is not only uh, the, uh, the, 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 the weight of each, which words in a topic, but also the weights of the topics, okay? So for example, we get here that in this document, there is, uh, this document talks 70% of colors and 30% of fruits, okay? So we have a document topic uh, distribution. This is very important. Because if I want to just a single answer, uh, so what, what's this document about? The LDA will give, will give us me an answer, and the answer will be colors. Then if I ask a second, uh, a second uh, object, then it will be about fruits. So uh, this is uh, the power of this technique, basically. So again, uh, we have a list of words that appear in all the documents. Uh, and the document one is only word one, two, three, four, seven, ten. And then what we have is that uh, we have another layer between between this uh, the word of the documents and the word of the words, uh, and is the words of the topics. What these uh, things are talking about. So you, you see, is the level of the object somehow. It's not the level of the entire document. It's not the level of the single word. We build objects that are some middle sites. Um, uh, features uh, between the documents and the words. We, we research features in our, in our documents. So now let's go to the analogy. Uh, the analogy uh, that has been proposed by Friat et al. 2020 is that we, uh, in linguistic, we have documents. 
And in physics, we have snapshots that are gridded maps, uh, for example, of DC level pressure. And uh, here I will use daily sea level pressure maps from 1948 to 2021 over the North Atlantic, okay? So these daily maps make a database of about 20,000, uh, 20,000, 25,000 uh, snapshots, okay? So uh, the grid points will be the words, and in the, in the domain that I consider, I consider 20 uh, point uh, in uh, uh, latitude and 15 longitude, so you have about 1,000 grid points. The number of occurrences will be the grid points values, and the topics will be, of course, the special patterns, and we will name them motifs. So grid points uh, values, so the values of the sea level pressure, are converted to positive integers, of course, by doing a rescaling, digitalization, and thresholding. And this has uh, not such a huge impact. The way you do the rescaling, the digitalization, and thresholding has a very little impact on the results I will show you. Another thing that we have to address uh, is that uh, we need to convert our observable values to positive integers. So since in the pressure maps, I show you that there are cyclones and anticyclones, we have to split the maps into two maps. So double the vocabulary types and make one for values greater than zero, another one for values smaller than zero. Uh, so that's, that's the procedure. And as you can see, it's very easy. Uh, so what we end up with is uh, we have to decide the only parameter left is how many motifs uh, we uh, demand to our techniques. So uh, a way to check that uh, we are representing our um, data set with an adequate number of motifs is to uh, increase the number of motifs and see uh, how the area, if the area stabilizes to a certain value. And for example, we see here that after 25 motifs, we start to be in a regime where the area uh, is of uh, about 1,500 kilometers. That is the typical sites of cyclones and anticyclones. So we don't impose this. This is uh, an emergent feature from the technique. So the object that we recognize have this site. And then we understand that this is the sites of cyclones and anticyclones, at least on average. Another way to, um, to understand uh, that uh, uh, the number, how many numbers of, uh, how many motives we need is to uh, compute uh, the uh, relative covered area by the motives for each of them, for, for all the maps. Again, you see here that after we reach 25, 28, we have an optimum number of motives and then uh, basically uh, we, do not, we, not, we do not add more information. So uh, this, thing, this fact that we set uh, uh, N as 28 uh, allows us to make the connection with another um, study, that uh, another series of studies that we did in our group uh, that is about the dimensionality of this uh, atmospheric flow over the North Atlantic. And uh, um, we can measure using dynamical system techniques the number of degrees of freedom of these, uh, uh, of these maps. And uh, 28 is uh, basically the upper bound of the number of degrees of freedom that are uh, usually between 5 and 20. So again, uh, we have uh, some uh, confirmation that uh, the number that we get uh, has a meaning uh, from uh, a physical uh, point of view. Keep in mind this number, the uh, five, 10, because I will, uh, I will uh, uh, com comment on it later on, okay? Uh, because you see, okay, the upper bound is 28, but why you have an average dimension of 10? So now you're curious to see what are these motives, and I will show you here. So here you see the domain of the study, and then you see the motives divided into high and lows. Uh, so the highs are uh, the anticyclones, and the lows are the low pressures of the cyclones. So uh, we could name all of them, uh, but I'm just showing here some of the name uh, that you may hear when you listen to the weather forecast. For example, H8 is the Siberian high uh, that uh, usually 
in winter is one of the responsible for cold spell. We will see this later. This guy here, H10, is the Azor Anticyclos that we hear every single time we listen to the weather forecast because basically uh, it gives us uh, the reference to describe the weather uh, at our latitude. And there are other uh, interesting guys, for example, for you, uh, this Genoa law uh, that um, is a low pressure system over the uh, Mediterranean is uh, a system that usually brings a lot of rain and also to the Balearic Islands, okay? Uh, whereas, uh, for example, L L10 will be the path, typical pattern of the storm over France. So you see here that uh, uh, every time, the, the, so these are the, the motives that, that I can get for all the maps. But the most important things I wanted to say is that for each given map, so if we take, for example, the map of today, I will have only a very limited number of motives that make my uh, uh, field well represented. Then this number will be between uh, five and 10, exactly like the local dimension uh, was saying. So uh, of course we will uh, have uh, that uh, the first uh, two motives will be probably one cyclone and anticyclone, and this will be the most intense features of the maps, not the, average features that we can get. So this, uh, you see immediately the interest of the of the composing the, uh, the maps in this way, because we start with the extremes. We start to see what are the most striking features. Whereas, for example, uh, the composition in Fourier uh, will give us some average uh, fields, but it won't tell us where are the, uh, the first component will not probably not be the, the most extreme ones, okay? So when we do the decomposition with the motives, we uh, are not optimizing a metric that is uh, L, L2. We are optimizing some metrics that is related rather with the extremes. And that's why we use it. To, uh, we have the idea of using it in our group. I will show you an application of this uh, based on uh, uh, extreme uh, events. Uh, and in the paper, uh, you can read about uh, storms on uh, uh, heat waves and uh, cold spells. So here I will focus on cold spells and uh, these uh, um, cold spells that I'm analyzing uh, here are not obtained by uh, definition of extreme events based on physical observable, for example, some temperature threshold, but they are defined in this database, EMDAT, that is publicly available by the number, uh, by the, the uh, their impacts. So by the death toll, the victims, whether a state of emergency and be declared or not. So they are based on the impacts. And in fact, why we are using this is because there was a, a lot of discussion in the community whether the uh, impactful extreme events can be related to uh, uh, the physics, the underlying physics, because it seems that uh, this relationship is difficult to find. Okay, so here we try to see if the mod some motives appear as uh, concurring with the cold spells, and also if there are precursors of these cold spells in the space of the motives. Okay, so it will be clearer now. And bear with me, I will spend a little bit uh, of time on this uh, transparency because uh, you see it's, there is a lot of information. So let's start from the right hand side. So this is, uh, and let's start with panel E. Sorry, I'm reading it the other way around, but that's uh, the most convenient uh, way to read it. So this panel E that you see here is the mean anomaly in hectopascal of the, all the events of cold spells over Europe in this database, okay? So you see that you are not expert with climate, but you see that uh, when we have a cold spell, we have high pressure over the North Europe and low pressure over South Europe, okay? Why? Because in winter, when we have high pressure over North Europe, we have stable conditions. And normally we have uh, the ground covered by snow. So when we have a stable condition at night, uh, the, the ground can emit the radiation to the space because the, 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 we have... Uh, uh, snow cover and cool down very efficiently. On the other hand, if we have uh, 
uh, low pressure over the south of Europe, you can uh, see that when we have a low pressure, the wind goes in an anti-clockwise direction. And so we have also over the Mediterranean wind coming from the north. And therefore, this cold air that is uh, produced here with this radiative effect is brought to the south of Europe and it generates snow and uh, cold conditions over the Mediterranean. Okay, so you can check uh, your favorite uh, event uh, where you got snow on uh, in Palma de Mallorca and you will see that probably it will have this kind of structure. Okay, so what is interesting now we go up, this is the weight of the motifs during the average of all the cold spell obtained by the impact. You see that uh, on average, uh, the weights are low, but we have that for these three uh, uh, motifs, H4, H3, and H2, uh, the weights are high. And you see that these uh, H4, H3, F2 are a uh, high pressure system on, in the north of Europe. So this tells us something about the fact that to build the cold spell over uh, all Europe, what we, we need to start is not the uh, low pressure, but rather the high pressure system. So now let's go on the left hand side of the panel. This is a video, and this shows the animation from day minus 14 to the day minus to the zero day of the evolution of the motive's weight uh, before uh, the event. Okay, so you can see uh, the average of the uh, uh, cold spell in the panel E again, and you can see that uh, even uh, six, seven days before, we have already these uh, H4 and H3 uh, motif appearing as a, a precursor of the extreme events. So why this can be useful? Because if we want to have uh, some idea of whether we're going towards a dangerous cold spell and we are in winter time, we could decompose our daily sea level pressure maps in the space of motives. And if we find this precursor, uh, we could uh, uh, understand that we have some probability of getting into a dangerous uh, cold spell. So in the paper, you also find the, um, the same analysis for the heat waves. And of course, the actors are different. And for the extratropical storms, and again, we have different motives. But for all of them, we can find a precursor that are kind of robust. Note that the average uh, of the motives uh, before uh, the, so when we are not in a, a, an extreme events or in a normal day, is uh, about what you see here. So the weight of each motive is below 4%. So these results are statistically significant well beyond one standard deviation, okay? So uh, there is a signal in it. The last applications I want to show you is climate change. So, and this also concern uh, what you see, uh, what we see guys in the Mediterranean Sea. I'm also an, uh, an island guy because I'm Sicilian. So this uh, also concern me. What we can see is the evolution of the weight of the motives over time from 1948 to 2020. And uh, um, here I'm plotting just four of the modules that have the most significant changes. You see we have H1, H11, and H12 that are represented here and are this um, high pressure system over the Mediterranean. And uh, um, L15 and L16 that are this low pressure system also over the Mediterranean. You see that they are not exactly symmetric, but uh, there is uh, some uh, symmetry between the two. And uh, we, we find that the hikes are increasing in weight in the present time, and the lows are decreasing in weight, okay? So indeed, and this is also our common experience in the Mediterranean, we observe less uh, precipitations, and this is dramatically true also this year, especially for Italy, and we observe more stable conditions that could bring to a desertification. So we have a, a very easy way to read these uh, in these uh, weights of the motives. Uh, and one thing that is not clear from here is that is uh, whether this is really a climate change signal or is just uh, some long-term variability of the climate. Because you see that 
there, is, uh, there are a lot of fluctuations to bring pause to this uh, trend. Uh, so it raised the questions of whether what we are seeing uh, uh, that is an effect driven by the dynamics because uh, it doesn't train when we are in high pressures. It re is this really due to the climate change or is just uh, interdecadal fluctuations of the uh, variability of these uh, pressure patterns. So uh, this is another application of uh, the LDA to the climate. And uh, I jump to the conclusion. Uh, the, the conclusion is that uh, we have uh, uh, found a way to adapt these uh, uh, Latin directly allocation techniques uh, from the world of uh, linguistic to the world of uh, gridded observables. So you can think to your applications, okay? I'm, uh, and uh, if you have time series or long data series, uh, um, in, in your domains, you, you can apply these techniques. And what is really good about this technique is that it identifies local patterns that are not global decomposition of your uh, maps into other maps, but really it's an object-based decomposition that privileges the extreme events. So it starts telling you what is the most striking feature in, uh, in, uh, in a group of elements, okay? So, uh, it won't beat the other decomposition techniques like uh, the L uh, in the L2 norms, but it will beat when we talk about extremes. Another thing that I didn't say is that if we use this in a generative way, we can also generate the fake maps by using the weights of the models and what we have discovered analyzing the data. The generation is way better because we, we, we preserve the extreme events and uh, we avoid to have patterns that do not really exist uh, in nature. Uh, so that's uh, all. Maybe I will uh, just uh, uh, finish by saying that with Luca, uh, we will apply this to uh, a problem that is uh, even more interesting, that is the one of extreme precipitations. And with extreme precipitation, you, I think you see immediately the interest of decomposing in object because uh, uh, if we have a storm in Palma and there is not a storm in Cagliari, we don't want uh, some decomposition technique to give us precipitation everywhere. We just want to localize the object and try to find uh, its evolution. So another extension of this technique would be to uh, uh, define motives, not just in space, but also in space and time. And this is apparently is possible. And uh, finally, I want to advertise this uh, summer school uh, that can be interested for uh, some of you. Uh, the time organizing with Erika Coppola in, uh, in uh, Trieste. Uh, and this will be about artificial intelligence for detection and attribution of climate extremes. What is important to say that the applications are open until the 24th of April, and also that we have uh, the expenses fully covered for students and their early career uh, research. So I stop here and uh, I thank you again, uh, the organizers for, uh, for uh, the kind invitation. Uh, here is some uh, of uh, some contacts to keep in touch. Uh, and I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, from uh, the audience. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you, David. So it's uh, it's time to, to ask questions or to, to make comments. I, as always, uh, I invite first the students if they want to to ask some questions or make some comments. <clears throat> Don't be shy. It seems that the they don't, they don't want to start. So uh, any other, so any other people in uh, the audience, just um, you have a question, just unmute yourself and, and ask the question. I, I have a question regarding the, 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 the extreme event itself. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what is an extreme event? I mean, what, what it makes sure, how do you can make sure from, say, if you have a time series and that you have, say, what well, now you are considering a stream event, it will not be an extreme event later on. 
for a long time series, or on the other hand, how much events do you consider to be extreme events? Where, where you draw the line and, and to which extent this is important for the, for the analysis? Yeah, so the database I'm uh, considering here, it's not me who made it, it's a database that exists in uh, the literature and it's based, so the definition of extreme is whether someone has died uh, for, and uh, it's confirmed to have died from, uh, for example, the cold spell or the heat waves, uh, or if there were damages associated to uh, infrastructure, or if uh, the, in a state of emergency had been declared after the event. So this database is based on events, uh, on impacts. Then there are other databases that are based on uh, 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 statistics. For example, you can define as, uh, so a, a way to define heat wave is to consider uh, either some fixed or moving threshold, for example, 35 degrees of uh, daily average temperature and uh, to have at least three or five days uh, in a row uh, above this threshold. So this is statistical definition, not always the two are uh, coincide because uh, uh, you can have uh, that uh, uh, neat ways that was not uh, uh, so too intense from the point of view of temperature made a lot of health damages because it was there was a very high rate of humidity uh, or uh, maybe in a cold spell uh, the main the, the main hazard was snow instead of uh, cold or cold instead of snow so you see that uh, the, the the definitions sometimes don't match. And also um, the other thing is that when uh, we have this uh, impact database, uh, many times they are incomplete. Mm -hmm. So we have a project with other European colleagues also based on machine learning to retrieve uh, impact yeah. extreme events from uh, Wikipedia using machine learning uh, data, uh, text, uh, text scanning uh, analysis techniques. Yeah, so, so then, then if you use the different approaches that you say, you obtain similar results. Yes, I mean, for at least uh, I tried with another student to get to use a statistical definition of, uh, uh, of cold spell and the heat waves that is the one you find on the Meteo France website and the one I was saying. So temperature below some threshold values for several days in a row. And uh, also, if you restrict the region towards uh, France or Spain, uh, you can find better precursor with the uh, with the LDA with uh, this technique. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. For questions, I have one myself. Is um, it, this technique detects uh, uh, localized patterns? But I mean, anti anti cyclones and cyclones move. Um, so today, uh, some cyclone is uh, on in Spain, uh, then tomorrow can be on Italy. Uh, so, is is there any way to take into account these moving characteristics of these kind of things? Yes, well, yes, yeah. there is, uh, there is, and we can definitely. I mean, we will definitely look into it uh, uh, soon with Luca. Uh, so you can define motives in uh, space and time. So there will be uh, trajectories of cycle, typical trajectories of cyclones and anticyclones. Uh, there is not, uh, in my opinion, the, uh, we'll see what happens, but both the descriptions are useful because for climate, you are interested in, uh, in also knowing what is there today and not only uh, not what, what is going, uh, but uh, uh, what can be interesting with the space and time uh, motives is uh, whether the trajectories of these motives change, okay? So uh, if, for example, climate change make uh, the cyclone moving uh, different with respect to what we observe now. But uh, Emilio, one, one difficulty is that uh, you add on the number of motives because uh, uh, Somehow you have, you have to you have to think not only at what pattern you can have but also where they can move. So uh, the the problem is that then you lose a little bit interpretability in the sense that you end up with having uh, hundreds of motives that are uh, less readable than what uh, than what you have here in in this static version. So we have to see 
uh, what, uh, what comes uh, out and uh, if it can uh, improve uh, the interpretability or not. Thanks. Welcome. More questions? I have a curiosity. Why is this called this Latin Dirichlet allocation? It's a very complicated name for. So it's has some, it's easy to explain the origin of the name. <laughs> I don't know honestly, but uh, I will I will dig and uh, look into into it. Uh, I think allocation uh, allocation comes from the fact that uh, some, somehow you allocate the recurrences of the words to a specific uh, object. Uh, and latent may be referred to the fact that it is an uns unsupervised, unsupervised machine learning methodology. So you're not giving information about uh, the data. Mm -hmm. So you find the latent uh, pattern that uh, are, are written in this, uh, in this, uh, in the data. But uh, about Dirichlet, I'm not sure uh, why uh, it's there. So I, I will have a look. Okay. More comments? If there are no, no more questions or comments, then let's thank the thank David again. Thank you very and, much. And okay, so uh, let's let's hope that we can meet uh, in person soon. And in between, take call, take care of the cold spells here in Mallorca. is really chilly. <laughs> That's the yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> this this, uh, this winter has been quite cold in Mediterranean, so. Um, yeah, also I wanted to say if you want to try the code on your data, uh, we are available uh, to share it uh, and we'll be interested because we think that uh, we can get also more insights to see other people working on LDA uh, in different applications. So thank you. Thank you very much again. Okay. So then uh, that's it. That's it. So I'll see you next week in the next seminar. and. Good. Have a nice week. Oh, are you okay? Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.